six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have lift off at two thirteen. And it is clear the tower. Prepare yourself for a world of science. Oh, what is going on, everybody? Conley here with the Science Nights. We have uh, Dr. Thomas Schiller and Dr. Anurban Bhattacharjee in the studio. What's up, y'all? Doing good. Yeah. Staying warm. All right. Well, good, good. <laughs> uh, Sean Graham is out in Australia right now, sound asleep, just a snoozing away, isn't he? Yeah. It's like three o'clock over there. So <laughs> yeah, his, his alarm clock must not have gone off. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure he's uh, he's just uh, counting those uh, sheep out there right now. But uh, we're down there, I guess you should say. Well, we have a really fun show for you. Um, Dr. Anurban Bhattacharjee, physicist and astronomer extraordinaire, gonna we're, we're gonna wrap with you a little bit uh, on uh, electricity because recently, as you know, we lost power this week. I, I no. did. Not everybody. <laughs> did you? Yeah, we lost it for about thirty six hours. Thirty six hours. Yep. Oh, okay. We well, had water the whole time, but we lost power for about thirty six hours. Yeah, out in the. Uh, I guess I would say east side of town, uh, there was power lost for a good 58, mm -hmm. 58 hours. So how about you, Anurban? Did you lose? I was one of the very fortunate ones. I just lost cell phone connection for seven or eight hours. That's oh, about man. It. Oh, that yeah. must have been tough. How, how did you get through it? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Just went back to 1980s, I guess. <laughs> oh, <I'm> sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those, those uh, car phones and a leather pouch. Yeah, yeah. kind of like that. Too, but <clears throat> no, I was really fortunate in that regard. And. Um, but I didn't really lose any power, so oh. yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, we actually had fun. We had it was like camping for us, you know. Yeah, we had all the the camping equipment: propane stove, propane heater, and um, it was good. We just read books and hung out under the blankets. My two year old had a blast with all of his layers on and playing in the snow. So, <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, wasn't too bad for us. Very wholesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you got to watch out for that CO two poisoning. Yeah, we we had our carbon monoxide detector on, so um, and made sure that the house was well ventilated when we when we brought the heater inside. We didn't have to use it that much though because we had lots of jackets and blankets and things like that. Oh, very cool, yeah. very cool. And you set up a tent inside the house. Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, we didn't. My my two year old has a little tent in his bedroom. Oh, um, okay. Which happened to be like the warmest place in the house, so we spent some time in his little tent in his bedroom. But That's otherwise, cool. we just yeah hung out under the blankets and nice, very cool, had a good time. Just watching Netflix in that third eye there, huh? Yeah, yeah, using our brains <laughs> instead of mindlessly staring at the TV it was it was good. I yeah, I bet it's very stimulating for us too. Like because we had to be creative. We went we went back to the like 1950s. We were playing Yahtzee. And uh, dominoes, and we just yeah. kind of, you know, played a little bit. It was it was cool. I, I mean, I, I was fine, but uh, did did have to do some running around for other people that weren't as fortunate that they couldn't get out. Uh, I luckily have a four wheel drive, and so you know that mm -hmm. uh, that gave me the ability to help others, which yeah. is really good. Yeah, but, I hope I hope it turns into a learning experience for people. Yeah, um, to kind of always be prepared, not like bomb shelter prepared necessarily but um it's good to have some canned food and water stowed away just in case um and i think some people weren't prepared and um it, like if you go on social media on facebook you see there were a lot of people who were kind of frantic because sure. they, oh, yeah. they didn't have any food or water stored uh, up so to be also very honest on this as i wasn't prepared i would have been frantic if that's happened to me because yeah. i I'm on the other hand, like, I expect, this is the United States, there should not be a catastrophic failure over 24 hours of this sort. 
And it doesn't matter if Texas is this going to happen once in 30 years. Uh, they were forewarned before this. This is not like this is going to happen suddenly. So if your industry and if you're getting warnings, you need to prepare yourself sure. for what's coming. So I think it's completely, uh, I mean, if yeah, sure, if there's a hurricane hitting you, a cyclone there, suddenly something happens and the tsunami comes and wipes like all the stuff that happens in Japan. Sure, that is completely understandable. And But on this, this is like, we need this was coming yeah and uh, and there's an expectation from in basically people is providing you power to get yourself prepared mm -hmm. and this is this is not right I mean, to, in my mind, this is not acceptable at all. And, and um, right. yeah. And this <clears throat> might be a good, a good segue into our first topic. We're going to be talking about two things today. Um, one is energy. <clears throat> Sorry. <Yeah. clears throat> energy. Um, how we get it, how we produce it. Um, so what, what happened? Well, to, to my understanding, what happened was our, our natural gas infrastructure mm -hmm basically froze over as well as the the i think 20 percent of the energy we get is from wind turbines wind tur about 17 yeah. is it 17 yeah. yeah um and they also froze up so it was a combination right. of natural gas and wind energy um that just was not prepared for um an event like this right um old technology outdated technology um that wasn't able to 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 was generate energy cold, yeah. um, in the, the you know close to zero degree conditions. Sure. And yeah. The, and down here we're not really no prepared no, no, for no, it no, anyway. absolutely no. And I do understand that part. Like the Texas never come. This doesn't happen. And right. I mean, I've lived eight years in Wyoming, so I know what it feels like actual cold to hit. So I mm -hmm. know what is it. But uh, they're always prepared and everything like that. So yeah, but I and, always wonder like uh, how much time it would take for like even if we had like a week. El like Paso didn't have any problem. Oh, they didn't. No, okay. because they had winterized their power grid, and so they were oh, good to go. Mm -hmm. El Paso had warning, and El Paso is hotter than other places in mm -hmm. Texas. So I don't see the uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's definitely something yeah. that we will have yeah, to investigate but, uh, and look yeah, more I, into. Yeah, I don't think science nights should like go more into science part of yeah, the energy yeah, stuff yeah, rather yeah. yeah well first off that comes to the the real question is okay now this is something amazing funny story uh, a while back we got this um uh it's a hot spot a wi-fi hot spot okay okay you know what that is yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it's this little mechanical device and it just makes internet it just makes it somehow and uh, you charge it up, and then boom, you have internet. Uh, I don't know what gnome is inside of that thing. <laughs> I don't know what kind of magic that they use. If they're like, you know. Well, I was going to say, basically, it's kind of like a SIM card which is in there, which will just connect to the uh, data service part of your cell, cell network yeah. and provide you Wi-Fi through that. So, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but it's amazing how, yeah, it, how is, it all yeah. works. So what what is our electricity like we have to make energy right mm -hmm. and then we have to store the energy and put it through our grid is that correct yep okay yeah so what are some ways that we can make energy so most of our energy comes from burning hydrocarbons um down here in the southern part of the u.s it's mostly natural gas um <clears throat> and uh up north they depend a little bit more on coal um both of those are are hydrocarbons um, natural gas um, we get from ancient deposits where organic material has has accumulated and generates um, mostly methane from a process called uh, methanogenesis hmm. and that natural gas kind of fills the the cracks and the fissures beneath the surface and we can tap into that and extract it hmm. um, a lot of times it's associated with with um, oil so when we extract um, oil for like gasoline, um, we get a little bit of natural gas with that. And I think in Texas, I want to say I might be wrong here. I think Conley, you looked into the percentages. Um, maybe forty percent of our of Texas's energy comes from natural gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, over I think it's over forty. I Is think it over forty-eight? Like 40? Okay. Something like um, that. So most of our energy here in Texas comes from natural gas, and we basically we burn it to generate electricity and, and 
provide that to the to the grid. I mean, yeah. I was going to say, barring solar power, sure. right? Barring solar power, there is only the basic fundamental principle, right? You, you burn the uh, gas, oil, the nuclear fuel, whatever you do. And I, and I think we have talked about this a little bit earlier, too, is basically you want to, what you want to do is um, boil water, mm-hmm. right? But boiling water, what it provides you steam, and that gives your turbine running. And the same turbines you see is what's uh, like in the windmills, what keeps on moving, that's turbine. And that's what, and you take the turbine and they ha- and what you do is basically have an electric wire kind of a loop inside a magnetic field. So and mm-hmm. that kind of generates a current. So basically, the principle is if you have a metal conductor kind of a loop thing inside a, inside a magnetic field. Mm-hmm. So the magnetic field. Uh, so as you turn that loop, the wire loop, the magnetic field changes, and the changing magnetic field, even though it's permanent, but the amount of magnetic field that is the loop is kind of going through changes. Um, it's a little technical, but uh, yeah. as it changes, it produces current. So, but fundamental principle is that you need something, a metal object, to rotate inside a magnetic field. Right. So, anything that you see that swirls, that the turbines that are moving is basically what they're doing. The dams, the water they're falling is basically moving your turbines mm-hmm. in a, uh, like a regulated manner. That's what we want to get the things moving, spinning in a circle, and that will generate electricity. And have they implemented underwater uh, windmills on the uh, on the coastline? I know uh, in the Pacific Northwest they have. Mm-hmm. You're talking about tidal, yeah, yeah. tidal power <coughs> generation. Yeah, tidal power yeah there is a lot in like especially in Denmark and all those areas they do mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, well, uh, I want to ask you a little bit, uh, Thomas, about oil mm-hmm. because there is a, um, I guess it, now it's a myth uh, that oil's old dinosaurs. Yeah, it's it's not. It's it's right. most of the oil that. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> most of the oil that we extract comes from the accumulation of tiny, tiny little organisms um, mm-hmm. that accumulate usually in the ocean. So you have kajillions of these these little uh, microorganisms that are allowed to accumulate. They don't break down, and then they're buried by sediment, and uh, they turn into this kind of um, carbon-rich sludge, this petroleum that we extract. Um, and then it's it's uh, extracted and refined into gasoline, and it's used for for other byproducts and things like that. Uh, but that's the stuff that goes into your car. Right. Um, the gases that are generated by that that process form the natural gas that we use for for electricity. Propane and yeah, propane, yeah. butane, methane, stuff like that. Right. Well, um, okay, so. Are these little organisms that are basically sludge, like you say, do those have, like evolve over billions of years? They've been around for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And and we're creating them right now. How long would yeah. it take, like if you had, you know, uh, I don't know, if you tried to farm them, like could you grow them? Or oh, what? no, we wouldn't be able to do that. It, would, <laughs> no. it, it takes many, many, many years for, for that. Many millions of years, like tens yeah. of millions of years. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. So, but, but they've, like you, like you asked, Conley, they have existed for a long time. So that's yeah. why we have such a, a abundant hydrocarbon reserve, mm-hmm. at least in that sense, because imagine the, the amount of ocean that's existed on the surface of the earth. Yeah. Um, and these little organisms inhabit kind of the upper part of the of the ocean, and when they die, they kind of fall down through the water column and settle on the ocean floor. And in places where there's um, not a lot of oxidation taking place, not a lot of bacteria to break them down, they can accumulate to the extent that they form hydrocarbon um, mm. uh, deposits. Wow! So, so and, like, and we've been extracting them for like a fraction. Yeah. Compared to their yeah. like nothing. Yeah, and that's that's one of the big controversies when it comes to to petroleum uh, extraction is just how much is left out there. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it's it's you see a huge range in the estimates depending on who's doing the, the estimating, right? Mm-hmm. So um, some people say that we've got fifty years worth of reserves um, based on our current rates of extraction, and others say it's twice, three times that. Um, and honestly, it's hard to it's hard to say. Um, the reason being is because um, in oil and gas industry, the technology is always evolving, and new and more efficient ways of extracting oil are 
are kind of coming into play, like mm. hydraulic fracking and stuff like that. Mm. So it's it's hard to say, um, but it is it is polluting. You know, burning hydrocarbons. Um, it generates greenhouse gases. It generates pollution. So um, all of these these alternate energy sources, wind and solar, um, are good things. Um, obviously, you know, wind isn't necessarily the most reliable source, but um, it's cleaner, at least in, in its uh, byproducts than, so, than oil. So I was going to point out, and here is we can make a distinction of where, as uh, Thomas was saying, about the current estimate of amount of, like, uh, the oil remaining or whatever, whatever mm -hmm. time it is, they're saying. Is like we can say this is what it means. It's a non-renewable source yeah. mm -hmm. because so there is no renewing this right. source, right? Yeah, and uh, and people need to understand like or not people. I would like, I don't know say if it sounds condescending or not when I use that term. But when we when I say when we say renewable, it means like it's it's not that the fact that the the solar energy that you're using. It's not that you're reusing that energy, mm -hmm. but it's like sun is going to be here for billions of years. So we can keep on using that, even worrying about if it's going to run out or not. So mm -hmm. that's what we are looking at. Like the wind is going to keep on moving. So it's not going to run out. Suddenly right. the wind is not going to come. I mean, <laughs> tides are going to mo happen every day. So that's what we are looking at. It's not something we're running out. Whereas like coal and petroleum, which at this point, uh, I was looking at numbers, like constitutes over 80% of world's uh, natural, uh, like uh, energy consumption, yeah. uh, like over that amount. So 80% is a big amount. Yeah. And, it's all, and it's going to keep on increasing. So uh, it's much better that we shift to like things like solar, wind, which uh, as uh, Thomas pointed out, doesn't... Uh, uh, release carbon dioxide and for any i mean even for the skeptics i would like to point out would you would you want to breathe in from the exhaust from your car I mean, right. that's the first thing nobody wants to do that mm -hmm. that's you know that's bad right if you can switch to a better cleaner source why not yeah so. well, well can we see it kind of like this because right now we're in a very primitive uh like i guess the way i see it is when humans first created fire and used tools I mean, they're very and they're ancestral, but they're also very primitive. They're to them, it was like cutting edge technology, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But now, to us, in this journey towards infinite energy, like we're using oil, and it's kind of a primitive like technique to to use this non renewable source that we know we're going to run out of, but we're using it right now as a boost in order to evolve our ideas and and. Yeah. Absolutely. Really kind of just grow and learn how to get this infinite energy. Yeah. Though. Yeah. And, and like Honorbon was saying, our reliance on it is, is incredible. 80%. Yeah. Um, and what people have to understand, I kind of have a more, I have a pragmatic look outlook on, on this, on this sort of thing is we need to gradually shift, I think. So yeah. my opinion, and I know this is the science nights, but, but uh, my opinion is, you know, maybe the solar and the wind, and we see it out here in West Texas. Mm-hmm is something at least now that's more practical um, to use on an individual scale. So you have solar panels at your house. You maybe have a couple of wind turbines. Mm -hmm. um, and then gradually shift away from, from, from petroleum. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing we might talk about this after the break um, that's kind of controversial is, is nuclear power. We haven't mentioned nuclear power yet. And I think Honorbon and I agree on nuclear power yeah, to no, an extent. Yeah, and, and I agree with what Thomas is saying. But what I personally would like to say is before, we're, like there should be a consistent encouragement from not just from the, from the general public and from governments around the world to sh do a, like a conscious shift. Mm -hmm. There should not, This should not be like uh, whatever it is, but there should be a conscious shift that... You depending on renewable is better than depending on rather than depending on non renewable. That's oh yeah, what, yeah, that yeah. is what. I and I think that's common sense. Yeah, yeah, right. I yeah. mean, there's going to be a bottom to the bucket at some point, and, and it's up to us to to you know what be appreciative of our oil field workers and be appreciative oh, yes. of no, I mean, the whole oil industry right now. And but also know that hey, we got to we got to shift away from this. This is going to end at some little, point. Yeah, little yeah. by little, every increment. It will help us. And just yeah. like our power outage is yeah. being prepared, right? Yep. We're, we got to right. shift into that uh, way of being prepared. So, all right, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with, uh, we'll segue into the nuclear energy, and then we'll get into uh, a little perseverance.
All right, we are back with the Science Nights. We have a special guest on the line. Going to ask the question. Uh, how how are you, guest? How are you, caller? Oh, you there? Hello. Uh oh. Well, that that happened. I think he's going to try calling back here. That's okay. We're going to get him back, and uh, we'll we'll take his call here shortly. Anyway, um, basically the uh, we're we're going to go ahead and get right on back into the show. Oh, here, there's a caller. Here we go. Hello, Rick. Yeah, Conley, sorry I dropped off. Not sure what the issue was. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We we have you calling in. You have a really good question for us, and uh, I kind of prefaced the nights here about it, but would you mind uh, letting our listeners know what your question is? Uh, by all means, yeah. So I really appreciate the show and what you guys are talking about. These are so important that we have dialogue about it. You know, as, as one who has a rather large you know, solar rent <laughs> our house to make sure we use solar power, "Quote unquote," the renewables. You know, one of the questions that comes up a lot now is in producing solar panels, uh, it consumes lots of energy. Uh, the same in terms of uh, creating the wind turbines consumes lots of energy. Certainly, all that can be done by electricity. But the challenge is when it comes time to recycle those, the cost of recycling and the impact from an environmental standpoint is now beginning to really be understood. Could you all talk about your perspective on that and how those issues are going to get resolved? Because if we're trying to use renewables to reduce our energy consumption, yet we're creating a greater environmental impact, we don't have a plan for that yet. Sure. Thanks for your question, Rick. Um, so I don't, I don't know too much about the, um, the costs and everything involved with that, but um, if you look at something like a wind turbine or uh, a big solar array, like you said, the just the raw materials that go into building something like that. There's metal and there's all sorts of electronics. Um, obviously, that stuff is going to require energy to, to produce. And I think another big component of the, the controversy there is what happens to a big wind turbine when it stops working. Like, can you maintain it? How many years can you maintain it for? And then once it is uh, dead, where does it go? Well, basically, it's either recycled or it gets dumped somewhere. And these are metals and electronics that are polluting. And um, like solar arrays, for example, and Rick, you probably know this a lot better than I do, um, have batteries. They have big, uh, you know, batteries linked together. And batteries have lithium and all sorts of nasty stuff in them that can be polluting to the groundwater. So that's a big question. And honestly, I don't I don't know what the... Um, what the uh, um, the folks who work in those industries are predicting when it comes to the environmental impact, but there will be one. Um, I was just going to point out, just for the cost right now, the solar arrays are pretty cheap. It has become really, really cheap. And one thing we will uh, need to consider, I mean, like these renewable, right? It's still coming into play. The more it comes into play, better we get. More money comes into research. Like uh, there are ideas which is uh, things like you know, we are going to make uh, our window panes and like the glasses, window glasses and everything as a solar array. They are trying to do a, like a transparent uh, solar pa a a arrays on your uh, window glasses and everything. So there is that. And another thing about the uh, construction as you're moving into renewable, what the, another thing is like you use the power, renewable power to make stuff for renewable energy. So there is that. We're also trying to get making batteries, which is Elon Musk has done in Australia, successfully implemented of using batteries to store energy. So if there's a power grid failure like this happened in Texas, like if the Australia goes into a blackout, they have backup power for like, I think, 12 hours or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So they have provided, they have a backup energy with the uh, batteries mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So there is that. And th there is an environmental uh, impact. But uh, on a personal front, I feel the environmental impact of uh, uh, wind, turbine, uh, wind turbines lying on the ground mm -hmm. can be controlled much easier than um, increasing the amount of carbon dioxide or methane in the Atmosphere. So, yeah, that that kind of brings me back to uh, Rick's initial question. Rick, are you still on the line with us? Yes, sir, I am. 
Okay, great. Yeah, and uh, you, you did mention about the cost of recycling as well. I know Elon Musk did make those batteries, but the cost to recycle them, I mean, that takes a lot of resources. I do agree. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a challenge, and we will, I mean, we are facing challenges even with, uh, we have faced, I mean, if you, if anybody remembers, like, uh, uh, like the exhaust from cars of, like, 50, 60 oh, yeah. years are way, like, way worse compared to now, right? We have become better, even with oil and um, gas and everything else. I, I, and I assume the same thing is going to happen to this renewable. Right. So, Rick, um, if you're still on the line, what, what has your experience been with your solar array? Is it, is it yeah, a good thing, a bad good thing? thing? Well, I think it's a good thing. Uh, you know, solar arrays are going to last 20, 25 years, and, and the better technology will continue to spread them out. That's all good. I just think, and my comment is, there really needs to be as much focus on the environmental impact about recycling when they're no longer available is we don't have to look too far beyond tires, car batteries, and all the other items that it takes, and that's never been included in the discussion. Mm. And I think it's an important part that when we think about making investments, not only do we need to make investments in the renewable products, we need to make investments about how we're going to handle these because we're now approaching a cycle we're coming up to about 20 years since solar's been out there, and stand by for the number of things that are going to have to be recycled. What we don't want is everything with lithium, lead, copper going into the dumps. We want it recycled, and there is not that infrastructure in place for it. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah, I, 100%. Well, thank you, Rick, uh, so much, and, and very good comments, great question, and we appreciate you listening and calling in. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Yeah, that's Rick Stevens, uh, city councilman, uh, and he has a, a show here on uh, KVLF uh, every week. And uh, he, uh, he's a really, man, very knowledgeable mm -hmm. person. Um, so um, uh, I was just going to say, so we were talk going to talk about nuclear, right? Yeah. And Thomas is a big proponent of nuclear. And I, I support nuclear because... Uh, anytime, um, like the, for example, people always think of Chernobyl, the first things that come into mind, come <laughs> yeah. into mind right? What will happen then? Well, it, one of the things about Chernobyl is it is a management failure, just like this one is a management failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, engineers were always warning and uh, warning us, uh, warning the people up in management. This needs to be. So you need to do something about this uh, and Chernobyl and. In fact, I would like to point out if the engineers did not shut the grids down this time in Texas, this would have been way worse. Yeah. Compared to way, yeah. way worse. Yeah, I, I saw that on the news this yeah. morning. They were they were looking at the potential for just having a, a total, total loss. To, yeah. yeah. To, wow. So some smart people yeah. jumped into action and, and shut prevented it a major, major, major disaster. Yeah. So ERCOT did did good. They were the traffic control, air traffic control. Was it ERCOT people? No, who, it they, was, no, it wasn't. These are, these are engineers uh, who are in. I don't know if ERCOT was even involved. These are oh wow. I I I am not sure. So Individuals. Yeah, I think that like engineers wow. basically telling people to shut the grids down because if the, because we were pulling power way too much from those and they were getting overloaded. Yeah. And if they had burned out, like replacing them would be even bigger pain. Oh wow, so, jeez. Yeah. So uh, yeah, science at work, right? Yeah, yeah. preventing <laughs> preventing some catastrophe. So, uh, so I, I think maybe in the future we'll do a full episode on nuclear power. Yeah, um, yeah. But well, I, we have I, about I, seven more minutes. I think after the break we'll start talking about Mars a little bit. We okay. can do a full show on Mars too. But <laughs> I think we're just going to focus after the break on uh, just the Mars a little bit yeah. perseverance yeah. because we have three missions. Uh, uh, oh, I was going to talk to you about this. Uh, um, very interesting power supply thing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and it's called Limnic Explosions, L I M N I C. Okay. Limnic Explosions, um, this phenomena that is uh, you can use. So, what I didn't know about this till yesterday. So somebody forwarded this to me. So, this is uh, something very interesting. So, you have a, a lake, right? Say you have a lake. <laughs> Uh, underneath the lake, there is a somehow you have a lot of carbon dioxide uh, deposit, like water. Yeah. Think about it like soda. Soda. Can right? I can I jump in there? Yes, go ahead. So this this has to do with lake stratification. Mm -hmm. I, for lake some reason, when you were telling me about this before we started the show, it, it didn't click. But yeah, lake stratification. Yeah, lake yeah. stratification. You can you have lakes in particular in uh, 
places close to the equator in the tropics that don't have a lot of seasonal fluctuation in temperature. Mm -hmm. So basically, the hypolimnion, the lowest layer of the lake, accumulates a bunch of gas. Gas. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, uh, yeah, because the pressure from the... So think about this. So you have, like, at least in Alpine in Texas, everybody loves Tropo Chico, right? Tropo oh, Chico, yeah. yeah. Mm. So you have the carbonated water, right? It's yeah. like you put, put carb, dissolved carbon dioxide inside water at a pressure, right? Same thing is happening. The top layers of the water is kind of pushing the lower layers down. They're also dissolving carbon dioxide. Right? And in these lakes, there's a huge amount of carbon dioxide that get dissolved in the bottom layers. Now, uh, what happens now is um, something uh, agitates. There is some kind of a disturbance. Mm. And that, that thing, now the bubbles up, the carbon dioxide, for some reason. And uh, one critical thing, it can, the lower layers of the lake uh, cannot be next to a geothermal vent because otherwise you are kind of churning the water up and down. So it's not going to work. It needs to be very calm underneath. So it can settle down, calm and cold, settle down, and the carbon dioxide explodes out, right? And uh, <laughs> yeah. now <laughs> it sounds very, it sounds very funny. It, like you have this huge. It's, carbon not, it's not funny at all because it kills a lot. Of yes, jeez. Oh, yeah. uh, in 1986, the first time it was recorded, it killed around 37 people in Cameroon. Whoa! And then, hold on, in 1987, and I think this is in. Um, Congo or somewhere, um, I don't know exact place, it killed over hundreds of people. Really? So what happens is the carbon dioxide comes out, right? Yeah. There's a huge amount of carbon dioxide, and this is like lakes which you have villages next to it, sure. and it spreads out, and it covers... Yeah, like an earthquake or a landslide can just trigger the lake to explode. Explode. And the carbon dioxide comes out and <sighs> covers these entire villages, and it kills off vegetation, it will kill off animals, kills off like, all the people living there, like... Yeah, and so now when you say it explodes, you're not talking about physically. You're just talking no, about it, explo it, it, it explodes, explodes out. Yeah. Oh, it does explode. Yeah. So, so there's actual shrapnel and stuff. The well, water. it's coming out of the water. water. Right. So it's just a pocket of gas that erupts out of the water. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And and people who witness it are not around long to to testify to. Oh because, my god. Yeah. Yeah, because wow. uh, you have this huge amount of carbon dioxide coming in, and you, you, usually it will, what has happened is the people were sleeping in the night. And the carbon dioxide spread down in the village. And they just and, wouldn't wake up. And wouldn't mm. wake up. And it's like complete wiped out. So there is like... The invisible enemy. And they'd still be in bed. Uh, like most They wouldn't yeah. be yeah. knocked and, and around or anything. So the technology that we have now mitigates that for the most part. And this is probably something yeah. you, you looked into, Anurban. But um, now in these big lakes, like in Central Africa, they basically take a big pipe, a big straw, and, and stick it down into the hypolimni on the lower layer of the lake. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, and and regulate the release of, of those gases. So and I'm assuming they're wanting yeah. to use it for energy production. So, yeah, so usually it's carbon dioxide that is happening, and, uh, um, and carbon dioxide, you can't really use it for energy purposes. But what we can do is there's a lake called Lake Kivu, and this is in the border of Rwanda and Democratic Congo, Republic of Congo. Uh, Con yeah, DCR, I think is what it's called now. Uh, what they do is in that lake Kivu is like a huge amount of methane underneath instead of carbon dioxide. So they use the methane, they kind of like extract the methane from the beds of that lake, mm -hmm. and they use that to generate power. So wow. that's a very cool... That's uh, really cool. Yeah. They're, they're, our, they're our taking our, something that could take them out yeah. and using it to make them flourish. Yeah. Our, a lot of our big landfills generate a lot of methane too, and... Um, for the most part, that stuff is just burnt off. They have flares that burn it off. And yeah. um, we're kind of reaching that point where the technology might be um, practical enough to where we can use it or harness it as an energy source. And there are a lot of big cities that will take that, that natural gas that comes out of landfills and they use it for their vehicles, their, mm. their municipal vehicles. Wow. And, and we do have one term for this, like which has been used for a long time throughout history of uh, our civilization called biomass. It's not biomass of ecology, but this is biomass basically where you have the, our waste products uh, of uh, animal bio, whatever left over, excre uh, excreta, and you use that to, and they re release when you store them and they will release a lot of mm -hmm. methane. Wow. And uh, you use that to generate uh, power. And it's, it's been used for a long time. It's not in different parts of Africa, uh, Asia. You use that like the uh, uh, product, mm -hmm. and you've been using it for a long time. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And these are all great, like novel ways of generating energy, and on a small scale, reducing the uh, the dependence we have on on 
hydrocarbons. Yeah. Um, but we've got like two minutes before the break, yeah. and I'm going to stand on my soapbox one more time. Go ahead. Um, to take that 80% of hydrocarbon reliance, me personally, and this is my opinion, and we can get people to call in or whatever, um, I think the only way we can practically shift from 80% reliance on hydrocarbons is to increase our reliance on nuclear energy. Mm. Because though it's not a renewable energy source, the material we use in nuclear power generation is incredibly abundant. Right. Uranium, plutonium, sure. uranium is everywhere. Right. And it's, it's easily and cheaply mined. Um, it's incredibly safe statistically. It doesn't seem like it, talking about like Chernobyl and Three yeah. Mile Island. It's incredibly safe. Places around the world use nuclear power. Um, and the technology um, has advanced so much since Chernobyl that um, it's a lot safer than, than I mean, petroleum. Um, I mean, thinking about it rationally, it took a tsunami in Japan, a huge tsunami to knock up nuclear pl power plant. Even then, they didn't go under whatever, whatever happened in Chernobyl. did not yeah, happen in Japan. There wasn't a meltdown. So, me there was no meltdown. So you can see how, how much of a say, uh, like in say, regards to safety, we have really come a long way. And it's not just uranium, plutonium, we have things like thorium too, which mm -hmm. you can use to generate uh, nuclear power. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, you know, I'm imagining, and this is just me, you know, responding to, to what you're talking about. I'm, I'm imagining a few things. Two-headed fish, uh, <laughs> you know, deer with like, you know, six legs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the so, Simpsons cartoon, Springfield, yeah. but in, instead of Springfield, it's Alpine. Yeah. That's Those what, two big old nuclear generators. Yeah, everyone thinks about that, but it doesn't, uh, happen. It doesn't, it doesn't happen, no. Yeah. It doesn't happen, and in the, in the, the byproduct of that, um, at least the, the, what's released from those plants, is steam. Oh, okay. yeah. And then you're left with... It's just water vapor. Yeah. The, what you're left with afterwards, the physical material is... is, is lead. Is lead and some... some radioactive material but which will decay again yeah we've got really great yeah. methods of of disposing of, of that stuff um, yeah but and, that's 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 my opinion and people are welcome to call in or and or, as uh like uh rick just pointed out like and we know how to safely uh, uh dispose of these mm -hmm. uh, right. things unlike solar and everything yeah. where we are still working on these things yeah know our, how to our, safely our disposal methods at least here in the states is re it's really incredible and it's 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 geology. You know, we've got nice. these huge, thick beds of halite salt. Yeah. And there are these mines that go hundreds of feet within the earth. And you take the, this nuclear waste material and you set it in, these, in this impermeable layer of salt. And the salt grows around it. Yeah. And it's encased in an impermeable layer of salt. Right? Wow. And when they, when they do these, these disposal um, sites... They take into account where the water table is, whether or not it's going to it's going to um, impact the water table, if it's going to pollute. Uh, so a lot of science goes into that, and it's a lot less polluting than than anything petroleum extraction and, yep. and refinement. Um, yeah. Wow. So I, I I suggest people do a little bit of research. Um, I think if we shift to nuclear, that's like the wave of the future, and that's going to take us into a new technological era and, and all sorts of things but and we'll have two heads we'll have two heads two, right. two brains for, sweet for double the science right? all right all right well we're gonna go to a commercial break and we will be right back after this all righty we are back with the science nights we have about 10 more minutes to go and we're gonna be talking you know okay so we've been talking about energy power lights right yeah. the, the the ability to create our own light source and, and energy and Netflix and all that good stuff. Well, I was driving around during the blackout. Uh, using energy. Using energy. 100% <laughs> using energy. Um, but I was driving around at night. And I noticed the sky is just unbelievably gorgeous without all the light pollution. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, my mind kind of wanders when I take those drives, you know, those night nightly drives just to... You know, especially with a blackout, you, you just want to see what's going on. And um, I always thought, I, I wonder right now, since most of Texas is out, what it looks like, how much a, of a difference it looks like from space. And I thought, uh, you know, I just had to think about the uh, Perseverance mission. Yeah. 
that that is out there. And we're going to talk about that uh, here right now. Uh, what do y'all think? Yeah, did y'all watch it? Yeah. 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 It's 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 a big deal um, for geological science and biological science. So it's it's right in my neighborhood. Um, so this mission is going to return. It's going to come back. No, no. Well, they're going to send uh, materials back. Well, no. the, they're going to be cached on Mars, and and hopefully in the near future there will be a mission to go pick the stuff up. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, right. the rover that's out there, that. Perseverance, that just landed, um, has a core drill um, uh, fixed to it, and it's going to go around through this crater and take geological samples with this core drill, cool. and it deposits them in little little tubes. And it's going to, from what I understand, it's going to leave little piles of these these tubes for the next mission to come and pick up. Wow. And uh, uh, it's also going to carry, you didn't mention the special thing, the seismometer is going to carry. Is this the first time you're going to actually study a, another planet than Mars? And what are the seismic effects that are happening inside uh, the planet mm-hmm. to get a better idea of what is the internal structure of Mars? And... Perseverance also has a helicopter called Ingenuity. Right. So that's going to be pretty cool. This is the first time we're going to be flying a... And, and does this little helicopter fix itself? Uh, what do you mean fix itself? Like if it crashes, if the wind takes it? I would be very surprised <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it does. For, I read a little bit about Ingenuity and, <laughs> and um, the funny thing about that is it's there just because it's cool to see if, if oh. we can fly things on Mars. Yeah. I think that's its only purpose oh, is to see, see if... It's like there's there's a NASA guy there with a remote control flying this little helicopter around. on Mars. Yeah. Well, my dad came up with a great idea, thinking of like this giant beach ball with a camera in it, mm-hmm. like a 360 camera, and just letting the wind on Mars just take it wherever. <laughs> I mean, I, I love that idea. I wish yeah. wish they would implement. But there's so much work and engineering and 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 time and money and effort spent into cr- making this real. Yeah. Like we're talking about colonizing Mars, yeah. and that's that's the really exciting thing beyond just the kind of intrinsic scientific value that we're getting is um, the main reason, or one of the main reasons that they're collecting and gathering these samples isn't just to study the geology and look for you know evidence of past life, but to make sure that there's nothing in the the surface soil of Mars that could harm people when we send them there. Right. Wow. So this is basically yeah. This is this. This step precedes another rover going to pick up the samples, returning those samples to Earth, yeah, and then making sure that it's safe, at least at that level, to send people. And uh, along with Perseverance, we have, like, also we should not forget, there are, like, two other missions, too. One is the United Arab Emirates Hope Mission, which arrived before Perseverance. Uh, and then uh, right after that, we had... Tianwen uh, one mission from China that also arrived. So three different missions right we happened within February uh, there. So uh, uh, to go briefly, Hope mission is basically is not going to land on Mars, but it's going to fly around Mars, le- studying the atmosphere of Mars in great detail. Uh, Tianwen one is basically going to look at the, they have landed on Mars and they're going to study what's happening with the on the surface of the Mars to study the magnetic magnetosphere, the magnetic field of Mars in detail. Yeah. So, uh, and then we have Perseverance coming into play, looking specifically for life if it existed, because they they landed in a riverbed. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, that's mm. another thing. So they landed have, in a lake. Yeah, or lake, what was yeah. probably a lake. Lake, yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah geologically, this it's is, it's really interesting because um, you look at the the surface Im- imagery of of Yezero Crater, this big crater that. The, Perseverance landed in, and it looks like like an ancient lake on on Earth. There there are river deltas that are feeding into it, and and um, it's just a big circular crater. And yeah. so the Perseverance, like Anurban was saying, um, its main goal is to see if it can find evidence of past life. So it's going to traverse across these delta deposits, you know, where these streams presumably. 3.8 billion years ago, dumped sediment into this lake basin. And it's going to drill into these delta deposits and the kind of marginal deposits of the crater to see if there's carbonates, things we find on uh, rocks we find on Earth that relate to, to biological activity. Wow. Um, so it's really cool. So yeah. so I have a question for you all then. Is, is this going to be like whoever gets there first claims it, <laughs> like, like King of the Mountain? 
Is, are, is that I don't what know. we're doing here? I, I, kind of, I kind of get the impression that they're, this is kind of the beginnings of another space race, which is kind of exciting. Oh, that is very yeah. exciting, yeah. That's, you know, competition drove us to the to the moon, so yeah. maybe it'll do the same for Mars, but I don't know how it works. In, if you plant a flag and Mars belongs to the U.S. <laughs> or to China <laughs> then, or what. Then you can expect wars, uh, space wars. I hope, I hope not. No, no space wars, no Star Wars. I mean, history. <laughs> a peace, a, peaceful peaceful uh, gathering of, of science. and That and, would be cool. Yeah, this, be cool. Is, this reminds me of that Eddie Izzard's, uh, like is a comedian who yeah. did this. Do you have a flag? If you don't have a flag, it's our country. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's British, isn't he? He's British. Yeah, yeah. He British. That's, That's what he said. That's that a, little, a, a little painful for you, Honorable? <laughs> Yeah, so he was like, it was really funny. Do you have a flag? No flag, no country. Wow. It's kind of like that, but. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, uh, so, no, I was going to say, like, no, this is really exciting for all of us, just scientists in general in, and people to see. Uh, I mean, Mars is a long, long way out there. I mean, yeah. it's a long, it took. It is uh, 300, close to 300 million miles. miles. Check this out. And Perseverance you know how fast it had to go to get there with the, uh, since last year, June last year? It had to go 24,600 miles per hour. Just to, fast. J- uh, that is just amazing to me, the physics behind it. And it landed safely. Yep. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that landing, here's an uh, audio clip of when it actually landed. Let's check this out. Catch on confirmed. Yeah. Yeah. Perseverance yeah. safely yeah. on the surface of Mars. The sands of past life. Wow, he got it. Uh, wow. This is so exciting. Uh, the team is beside themselves. It's, it's, it's so surreal. Yeah, I mean, it's surreal because they put all of this effort into absolute perfection. Yeah. Everything had to be perfect. Perfectly Everything. engineered. Yeah. It's oh. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and hope, hopefully we can get back up there to pick up this stuff pretty soon because I'm really curious to see what the what the soil and the the rock looks like. Yeah, well, it's an it's a very chaotic universe that we're in right now. I mean, think about our our energy crisis that we're talking about. You know, um, oh, I was uh, emissions. Point, uh, point out to Thomas. I mean, uh, J- Japan is already coming at, back with uh, picking up sample from an asteroid. So there is that. We have getting <laughs> samples. So uh, we are looking forward to that one. Before we get back from Mars, we will have sample from asteroids to study. That's another geologic thing too. Yeah, Geological sure. things too. Yeah. So we'll be looking at that. So yeah, we have pretty cool stuff going on. So yeah. So so if y'all are y'all are you like just chomping at the bit to get this information in your hand so you can research it yeah. yeah and and for me personally you know i'm i'm a paleontologist and a stratigrapher i i deal with stuff here on earth but i've been really tempted over the past couple of years at sol ross here to try and develop at least a couple of planetary geology classes because i think that's that's one <laughs> of these disciplines of geology that that we're going to see really evolve soon in the wow. near future i mean it's real wow well, you can teach half of my introductory geophysics class if you're so interested in that sure, yeah. <laughs> i mean uh one of the things is with this mars thing even if we don't manage to get the data uh, in a sense like actual sample back like having the seismometer up there would be a great uh then we can like uh as scientists like you do see a process happening on earth we study that and we want to see what happens in a different place right Mm -hmm. so now that we know we have seismometers on moon Mm -hmm. we this is going to be the third one and that would be pretty cool just for Mm -hmm. that purpose yeah and if if we do look at how quickly things happen in terms of our uh, technology and the advancement of science on earth we're going to find out a lot pretty quick especially now that we have a a seismometer on mars yeah and then when we get people Boots on the ground, it's gonna just leap. I'm Don't ready. Work. I'm ready. Yeah, I've got my I've got my rock hammer, my rock hammer, my backpack. If NASA <laughs> wants to call me up, um, I don't know if my wife. One way trip. Me. Yeah, I, I might have to take baby Thomas and, and my <laughs> wife along too. Put him in my put him in my carry on. Sneak him on board. Sneak him. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm going to find a Martian dinosaur. <laughs> nice. Hey, how cool would that be? Will that how be cool called? would that be? Oh Just goodness. finding ba- evidence of bacteria would be cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So As, the implications there are just are crazy. And I wish Sean were, were yeah. here with us to talk about it. But, man. I, I would be happy with just to eat virus, bacteria, like I should. Like any virus, <laughs> virus is okay, too. doesn't yeah. matter. Anything. That, that if, we found, if we found evidence of early, like, cyanobacteria on Mars... That basically means the the bacteria evolved at the same time in two different locations. Yeah. Wow. From from the basic material of, of life. Life given to us. That's amazing. Yeah. Charlie. But we, we we can't put our our what is it put our eggs in, I in mean, the basket yet. And to be <laughs> and to be very clear before we sign up for the show is like uh, we have provided individual building blocks of life on Earth. We have made them. Synthetically, yeah. Uh, so we have done all. I think this they stuff. just cloned a ferret recently. Yeah, that's. Uh, I was talking like uh, just uh, not just cloning. I was talking on the individual cell kind oh, of thing. Oh, okay. yeah. So we have done things like cell membrane. We have done things like uh, producing molecules, which produce uh, does energy productions. We have done uh, amino acids. We have produced every single thing, you know. But we have what we haven't done is put them all together and made them reproduce without any help. Mm-hmm. So Whoa. that's the step. That yeah. is remaining. That's yes. one one of the two requirements for life. They have to be able to replicate. Yeah. Well, it, it, let me let me tell the listeners if you're listening to this show and you're not excited about science, time to get excited about science. Uh, especially kids out there, man. There is a whole world ahead of you, and it is in a textbook. It really is. Yeah. Like put down it, it your, all starts put, there. Yeah. Put down your smartphone and and grab a book and. And get ready because you might be the first person who, who steps on Mars. Who knows? Or build a cell. Or yep. build a cell. Yeah. Yeah. They're probably Googling books uh, as we're as we're talking right now. I hope anyway. so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we will see you all next week for another great episode of the Science Nights. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Science Nights in the Morning. Be sure and follow us on Patreon for exclusive gear and uncut episodes. Check out the latest science articles on our Facebook page and subscribe to us on YouTube and your favorite podcast listening app. You can also listen every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time at BigBenRadio.com. And if you got a question, we'll join the discussion. Hit the hotline at 432-217-1983 and record your message. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for listening each and every week. That's Science Nights in the Morning with a K, and we'll see you next time.